Thank you. Thank you, Yuri, and thank you very much for uh, this invitation. Um, so today I would like to talk about um, how to use geometric deep learning for uh, computational design of proteins and maybe more broadly understanding how proteins interact with each other and other molecules. And I would say that probably without exaggeration, we can think of proteins as probably the most important uh, biomolecules. But you can see them everywhere in uh, all biochemical processes in our body from uh, defense mechanisms such as antibodies to, to catalytic reactions, giving structure to our, uh, to our tissues uh, such as uh, the skin and so on. And uh, chemically speaking, protein is uh, a, a large polymer molecule that consists of uh, uh, a chain of amino acids, so one dimensional sequence that then under the influence of electrostatic forces uh, folds into uh, complex uh, structures such as uh, helixes or, or, or sheets. And uh, overall it forms uh, this uh, complex 3D structure. So uh, probably a good metaphor for it is this uh, uh, snake toy. I don't know if, uh, at least from my childhood, uh, I've, uh, I remember playing with it. So this is one dimensional structure that you can fold more or less in anything you want. Now, the problem of protein folding, basically predicting the, the 3D conformation of the protein from the one dimensional sequence is itself notoriously hard problem in bioinformatics. And uh, recently, uh, machine learning methods have been applied to this uh, problem quite successfully uh, uh, with uh, DeepMind's AlphaFold from two years ago, in particular, uh, quite groundbreaking results. Here, we are interested in the inverse problem. In a sense, we are interested in protein design. So we want to design a protein that has certain uh, uh, functionality, certain properties. And I will say uh, a little bit uh, more in details what kind of properties we are interested in, but you can imagine that we want uh, this protein to bind to something. Uh, uh, usually proteins are uh, uh, targets for, for drug therapies and uh, we, want, we want, for example, to, to build a protein or to understand how it, it binds to something else. So a good metaphor for this is this lock and key metaphor. It's actually from Emil Fischer, a Nobel laureate that uh, uh, lived uh, more than 100 years ago. And uh, he compared the, the interaction of uh, proteins and biomolecules in general to a lock and the key. And uh, same way as there is this complementary shape, geometric shape in the lock and the key that enables it to open, so are proteins, but it's way more complicated because it's not only the, the geometric structure, it's also uh, their uh, chem chemical and physical properties. So it's convenient to think of these uh, multiple levels of uh, looking at proteins, starting with one dimensional sequence, uh, then uh, the 3D structure, and then uh, the uh, 3D structure conveys the protein, its functionality, such as binding to, to other molecules. And uh, of course, it's very appealing to work with one dimensional sequences because it's relatively easy to produce them for proteins and uh, they are simple objects that we can, that we can study. And in fact, uh, uh, many algorithms in bioinformatics have been developed for the study of protein sequences. So structures are more complex. You can simulate them, you can get them from, uh, from uh, crystallography. Uh, but unfortunately, the picture is more complicated than that because for example, you can find uh, proteins with a similar sequence but dissimilar structure or vice versa. You can find proteins with uh, very different sequences but uh, similar structure. And even worse, you can find uh, both dissimilar structure and dissimilar sequence but similar function. So you can see here that uh, all these four proteins uh, have completely different secondary tertiary structures but they bind to the same, uh, to the same molecule to another protein. So this leads us to this conjecture that, that the protein surface contains uh, some kind of interaction fingerprints uh, that can be learned and we will be using geometric deep learning uh, to do it. And uh, by learning these fingerprints, we will be able to understand uh, how proteins interact to each other. And that was a paper that appeared in the February issue of uh, Nature Methods. Probably the first application of uh, geometric deep learning to, uh, to the analysis of proteins to the best of my knowledge. So talking about proteins and 3D shapes in general, we can represent them in different ways. So we can think of them as uh, clouds of uh, atoms with a different size and different, uh, uh, and different types. We can think of them as graphs, basically representing again atoms and their uh, chemical bonds, uh, or the ribbon diagrams that you usually see when you plot proteins, uh, the secondary structures. Or we can think of them as molecular surfaces. So it's a kind of uh, a virtual thing that, that another molecule sees when it tries to interact with the protein. And uh, 
there are many reasons why you want to look at proteins as surfaces. One of them, obviously, it contains different structures, both genetic and chemical, such as pockets. But probably a, a more a deeper reason for this is that it allows us to abstract out the internal structure, the internal fold. And proteins usually fold in a way that, that hydrophobic and hydrophilic parts uh, are uh, pointing inwards or outwards. And you can see from this video, for example, that uh, the interaction with a small molecule really depends on, uh, on the, the way that the outside uh, uh, surface is structured. Uh, everything that uh, the internal fold that is shown here in these uh, different colors is uh, really at least uh, uh, some uh, level of abstraction that really doesn't matter. So another reason is that if we consider the structure of the surface uh, uh, rather than its Euclidean representation uh, in the, the three-dimensional space, it uh, tends to better model the, the interaction interfaces. We'll talk about it uh, later in, in a few minutes. And then finally, proteins are really not static structures. So because uh, 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 because of different quantum mechanical phenomena, they really wiggle and they deform. And especially when proteins uh, bind, they also change their conformation quite significantly. So all this uh, makes us want to uh, employ uh, geometric deep learning methods. So what is geometric deep learning? I guess uh, this figure shows it better than, than any description. So if you think of a, a three-dimensional surface as an object that lives in this three-dimensional space, you can try to apply standard deep learning techniques such as convolutional neural networks, maybe with three-dimensional filters. The problem is that there are not invariants to anything. So even, uh, even rotation, let alone deformation, uh, will uh, produce different results. So uh, one of the challenges uh, in the field of computer vision and computer graphics was how to uh, analyze uh, surfaces and build analogy uh, of convolution, uh, convolutional filters on the surface itself intrinsically. So that's uh, what geometric deep learning tries uh, try to answer. And in this uh, figure on the right, you can see that uh, when we design the filter uh, on the surface itself, we get, gain uh, basically an architecture that is automatically uh, invariant to, to a broad class of uh, both rigid and non-rigid transformations. So the architecture that we use for this work is what we call Monet. So it's based on our work from, from several years ago. Basically, we model our surfaces as meshes, and we have certain features in the nodes of uh, uh, on the nodes of this mesh. And around each node, we can create a local uh, structure of geodesic polar coordinates. So again, this uh, this is system of coordinates on the discrete mesh itself. And in this system of coordinates, we can create a system of weights. Uh, which uh, you can roughly think of them as a kind of soft pixels that are used to, to uh, locally average the, the features of the mesh. And then uh, you can just uh, take these averaged values of the features and multiply them by some learnable filter parameters, which will be the analogy of uh, a filter in standard convolutional neural network. So when doing this on molecules, we, as I said, represent uh, the surface, uh, the molecular surface as a mesh. We sample it at some number of points create these local geodesic patches. And in these patches, we use a combination of geometric and chemical features. So in the paper, we did it by pre-computation. Now we are able to compute everything on the fly. So all the geometric and chemical features are learnable from the, from the underlying uh, uh, atomic point cloud data. And then we uh, use this local system of coordinates to do uh, convolutional filters. And we can uh, concatenate multiple such layers like it is done in standard convolutional neural networks with the difference that now the conversion works on the surface itself, so it is geometric. And then plug in uh, some task-specific layers that uh, will depend on uh, what kind of problem we are trying to solve. And uh, in particular, we consider three types of problems. One of them is predicting interaction site. Another one is predicting uh, the uh, ligand. And so we know, for example, that there is a pocket that uh, binds to, to some small molecule we try to predict what molecule it is. And finally, we use uh, uh, the same architecture trained in a slightly different way for uh, fast protein-to-protein -protein interaction search. So let me show you an example of where this uh, method can be applied. So if, for example, you, you uh, I guess you heard about uh, cancer immunotherapy, which uh, uh, uses uh, typically the uh, program death ligand complex, uh, PD-1, PDL one uh, uh, which um, essentially uh, you try to block one of these proteins to allow the, the, the immune system to kill uh, to kill malignant cells. The problem with these proteins is that they are very flat. 
So uh, they're uh, what is called undruggable. So it's difficult to design a small molecule that, that will block uh, one of these proteins by, by binding to them. But uh, you can design another protein, so what, uh, potentially a biological drug that, that could uh, uh, target uh, this protein. And here we can use uh, the components of the system that I described before by, for, by identifying the, the site where uh, we are likely to bind and then uh, building a protein that, that will bind to this, uh, to this site. And I will show some examples uh, later. So let's look at the first task of interface site prediction. So essentially it's a point-wise binary classification problem. We have a training set that contains examples of uh, interface and non-interface points that are uh, collected from uh, multiple uh, public domain data sets such as PRISM and so on. We, we use uh, in total uh, uh, slightly more than 3000 uh, crystallized uh, structures with 90% uh, to 10% split between training and testing. And the performance criterion is uh, 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 ROC uh, uh, curve area under the ROC curve. So this is how the architecture looks like. So we feed in this uh, geometric convolutional network with uh, the, the chemical and uh, geometric features. And then, then we produce uh, a classification whether a point is, uh, uh, belongs to a site or not. And here you can see a typical example. So uh, the green curve uh, shows the, the ground truth where the interface uh, exists in this protein. And uh, the heat map shows the probability of a point being uh, an interface. So this is rather good prediction. And it's in line with the ROC. You see that we get, which is about 85%. So here you can see the distribution uh, of uh, uh, true interface and non-interface points. Their uh, uh, their predicted uh, predicted interface scores, and uh, an ablation study where we we uh, test the influence of different features. Uh, the trade-off between using chemical and geometric features. We see that the best results are achieved with a combination of uh, geometric and chemical features. So here are some uh, more examples, and this is actually a good example because uh, this is uh, a protein which has rather flat interface, so it's uh, difficult to target with uh, with, uh, uh, with a small molecule. Uh, uh, I think it's some viral epitope. So uh, you can see on the left the wild type and the, the, the modified protein that was uh, hand engineered in the lab to bind to, to its target. And uh, you see that our uh, uh, interface detector shows that in the uh, in the protein on the left, it's unlikely to, to be an interface, and in, in protein on the right, which was engineered properly, uh, it is uh, likely to bind. Here are some more examples. So I think this is uh, an influenza inhibitor, and uh, these are some more uh, complex proteins that, that assemble into, into cages. Uh, so we can go deeper with uh, multiple convolutional layers. This was just one convolutional layer, uh, and uh, with, for example, three convolutional layers, we get uh, results that are better, and overall the, the scores are, look much smoother. And if we compare it to, to some other methods that are used for uh, predicting uh, interaction sites on proteins, we see that, that uh, we, we have significantly better performance. So here's a comparison to SPIDER. Uh, and again, uh, the distribution of the scores for interface and non-interface points. So here is uh, some more pictures showing the comparison to spider. And you see that uh, in difficult cases like this one, spider uh, prediction is rather uh, useless. OK, so let's talk about the pocket classification. So in this case, we, uh, we look at the pocket of a protein. We know where it is. We know that it binds one of these uh, seven small molecules. And some of them are actually structurally very similar, like those shown here. And we try to classify uh, uh, basically which uh, pocket, uh, which molecule this pocket uh, binds. And uh, this is also a classification problem uh, in this case with seven classes because uh, these are this is the number of ligands that, that we are trying to classify. The training set here are proteins that interact with different small molecules, total slightly less than 1500 structures. And again, here we use uh, about uh, 80% of the of the set for training and validation and 20% for testing. So here it's important that actually that the training and the testing splits are uh, done correctly. So we don't uh, train and test on proteins that, that look more or less the same. So we, we did very careful split based on the uh, homology of the sequences of, of these proteins. And here you can see confusion matrix of uh, uh, ligand specificity. 
uh, that, that is trained with uh, chemical and geometric features. You see that, that we have a very good classification of the, the, the different small molecules. Again, here, the, the, the best combination is achieved by using both geometric and chemical features. And here you can see some examples of how these uh, pockets uh, look like, and even with structurally similar uh, proteins that nevertheless bind different ligands, we are able to, to distinguish between, uh, between these different pockets. And here is a zoomed uh, in version of uh, the picture uh, from the previous slide. So the final thing that uh, the, the final type of uh, problems that uh, we are addressing with this architecture is uh, fast protein-to-protein uh, -protein interaction search. And there are many reasons why you would be interested in protein-to-protein -protein interaction. Uh, one of them, obviously, it's uh, fundamental biological research. So we want to understand how, uh, uh, how living uh, cells work. So uh, we have, I think, about uh, 20,000 different uh, proteins that are genetically encoded in, in, in human species. Uh, uh, so uh, trying to, to uh, uh, trying to predict how all these proteins interact to each other might be important to understanding of uh, different biological process, but also for uh, many drugs uh, that, that would like to target uh, uh, protein to protein interactions, it's actually hard to target them with, with small molecules. So it could be uh, potentially interesting uh, uh, targets for drug theories as well. So for the PPI prediction, we actually do something slightly different. So we want to build a local feature descriptor that is uh, indicative of interaction. And uh, for this purpose, we use a Siamese architecture. So it's uh, uh, two neural networks that are coupled together. And we use uh, 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 triplets for training. So we have uh, a point and a patch around it. And then we have a, a another page that comes from uh, the counterpart that binds to this protein, which we call the positive. So uh, this pair of X and X plus are uh, patches from interacting surfaces. And uh, another pair, X and X minus, which we call negatives, are non-interacting. So it's a patch from some random protein. We use a triplet loss, a particular form of it, which we call D-prime loss. So instead of looking at uh, just a, uh, uh, sample-wise uh, uh, difference, we look at the distributions of positives and negatives. So you can see the, these technical details in, in the paper. So uh, the training set, again, uh, 80 to 20% split between training and testing uh, using uh, 6,000 uh, protein-to-protein interactions that are available from uh, open source data sets. So here is uh, how the uh, architecture looks like. So we have here on the top a pair of interacting patches. I should say that uh, it's important to see here that they are actually complementary. So they're usually complementary both in geometry and in charge. So uh, what we do, we also invert uh, one of them uh, uh, as part of the architecture, uh, invert the charge and the geometric uh, curvature features. So it makes it easier for the, for the neural network uh, to learn the, the, the scriptures. And we also have a pair of non-interacting uh, patches uh, that you can see at the, uh, at the bottom. And what we try to do is to build descriptors that are as similar as possible for the uh, interacting patches and as dissimilar as possible for non-interacting patches. And that's exactly what this triplet loss, loss tries to, uh, 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 to optimize. So you can see here a distribution of uh, the distances between these descriptors for interacting patches that are shown in yellow and non-interacting patches that are shown in blue. And you can see that there is quite nice and clear separation between, uh, between the two. So we can really distinguish well between uh, these the different sites. And in fact, the performance in terms of uh, uh, ROCA AUC is uh, pretty high. So it's 99%. Uh, so it's a rather dramatic difference, I would say, compared to, to, to the best uh, 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 descriptors that are not uh, based on uh, geometric deep learning. So here are some more detailed, uh, uh, some more detailed analysis of this, where we also split the data set into patches with different levels of complementarity. So uh, obviously, when the complementarity is very high, it's not very surprising that these uh, uh, that these kind of descriptors are able to to, uh, to predict uh, correctly the, the binding. But when the complementarity is very low, it is actually a much more difficult problem, and nevertheless we get uh, rather good results. We have uh, ROCA AUC of about uh, 81%. So talking about uh, 
fast uh, PPI search. So if uh, you think again of this metaphor of uh, protein interaction as a lock and the key, so here uh, you can think of uh, hundreds or even thousands of different locks and uh, thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of uh, different keys that we try to fit. And we want to do it fast. So uh, this is an experiment of large scale docking. Here we compare uh, to PageDoc and ZDoc. And uh, the results shown here, this, this is the number of solved complexes uh, in, the, in the top uh, 110 or one. Uh, and uh, well, solved complexes that are found to be within certain uh, root mean square distance. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, we perform on par in terms of the accuracy with uh, page talk, but look at uh, the difference in time. It's about 10,000 uh, times faster. And uh, here is another example. So these are the, uh, the unbound structures. So the, the difference being that when uh, proteins bind, their 3D conformation can change. So uh, uh, your target is usually unbound in its unbound state, and it's, uh, it, it might change significantly. So here the results are uh, slightly worse. It's a more uh, difficult problem, but nevertheless, again, uh, the performance is better than, than uh, other algorithms. and. Uh, it is way, way faster. So here are some experimental results. So for the designs that we have, so this is a cancer target. We have uh, uh, used Massive to identify uh, uh, different, uh, different protein binders. You can see that they're actually completely different. So the one in the top, for example, it, it, has, uh, it has a sheet-like structure. Uh, uh, the second one has a helix that is uh, along this interface. And the, the third one has two helixes. Uh, uh, across the interface. So completely different structures, completely different binders. Uh, they, they all uh, bind uh, uh, very nicely. And uh, we also have a crystal structure for uh, one of these binders. We actually have more of it I'm showing here. Uh, one that uh, co corresponds very well with the, with the design structure, the overall uh, protein complex alignment has a root uh, mean square distance of less than one angstrom which uh, my uh, uh, protein design uh, colleagues are saying that this is a very good accuracy. So just uh, very recent results that, that, uh, that uh, we, uh, I, I can show here. Uh, this is very recent work of my, uh, uh, my students, uh, uh, Freyas Verison and uh, Jean Pidi. Uh, a faster version of Massive. Massive is already about a year old. Uh, so here we have a new architecture that uh, does all the computation steps on the fly directly from the atomic point cloud, computing all the features uh, directly from, uh, from these, uh, um, uh, from these uh, atom coordinates and atom types. Also building the surface representation on the fly. This is about uh, three orders of magnitude faster than what we had in Massive, the first version. The inference, the forward pass, is also about in order of magnitude faster. And so is the uh, memory uh, uh, footprint. So it is. Uh, uh, it will allow to, to to deal with even bigger uh, data sets of, uh, of proteins. So I think I will conclude here. So I hope that uh, I convince you that uh, geometric deep learning is a novel tool set that can be applied to different problems in protein science. It allows to design task specific and data driven descriptors for. Uh, protein structure and functionality. It is significantly more accurate and faster than previous methods. And it allows, for example, uh, if we're talking about uh, uh, development of new therapies, dealing with uh, potentially undruggable or previously undruggable flat interfaces and protein-to-protein uh, uh, -protein interactions. Uh, what is important that unlike uh, most of the methods that exist in this field, it's independent of the sequence or uh, evolutionary history of the, the protein. And this is especially important for de novo design proteins where the protein is completely new, never existed in nature. So you cannot rely on uh, similar proteins uh, that, that might have been observed in other species that, that are related. So uh, uh, that's the, obviously the advantage of using uh, geometric structure as opposed to, to the sequence. So there are a few challenges and open problems. So the, the bound versus unbound protein uh, uh, um, docking is uh, is problematic. And, well, it's not only our problem, but in particular, we are not that good with uh, with with, the, with this problem. So we are still working on it. Uh, we are still working on experimental validation, so getting a crystal structure. And uh, so far, things look very good there. Uh, interestingly, the 
ligand uh, classification with the pockets that I showed was completely uh, oblivious of the structure of the ligand molecule uh, itself. So uh, one thing that would be uh, would be almost immediate is to incorporate the ligand description. And for small molecules, it might be a good idea to use, for example, graph neural networks, like uh, what, what was mentioned in previous talks, uh, uh, to describe its uh, structure and binding properties. It might be interesting to incorporate evolutionary history, so to, to, to look at some joint descriptors, uh, both for structure and for, uh, for protein sequence. And uh, I think now with the new uh, version of Massive, we are finally uh, at the stage where we can do end-to-end -end, uh, generative model, where we can design a protein end-to-end -end that, that has certain functionality. Uh, it will be interesting to look at protein-to-protein -protein interaction networks, so predicting interactions between multiple proteins at the same time. And uh, in principle, the framework is not uh, limited only to proteins. Uh, well, we did, we, we did look at proteins, but it can be applied to other uh, biomolecules as well. So I guess uh, with the COVID pandemic, I think uh, I, uh, it's, it would be possible not to show something that, that has to do with COVID. So this is one of the uh, spike proteins and uh, the ACE2 receptor to which, uh, uh, through which the, the, the virus enters into our body. And uh, here we are uh, trying to predict a site uh, where, uh, where uh, the, the, the viral protein binds to, to, to this receptor. And it's interesting that, that uh, besides the, the well-known site, there is another one that is probably less explored. And uh, Massif also predicts uh, a small protein that, that could potentially bind to it. So it's probably very far uh, from uh, being used for any therapeutic application. And I hope that by the time that, that this move moves forward, we'll have a vaccine that will solve the COVID problem for all. But I think it, it shows an interesting potential application of uh, designing uh, protein-based drugs against uh, different diseases. So I guess at this point, I will stop and thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, uh, for a very interesting talk. Um, we have a number of uh, questions, uh, so I'll, I'll go through them and, um, and we'll hear your answers. So uh, first one was, uh, how, do, how do these models you presented deal with both translational modifications uh, and other similar uh, things that, uh, uh, that actually modify the surface topology? So I don't know what is uh, what is meant by uh, post-translational modification. So surface topology uh, uh, could be uh, could be problematic potentially. So uh, if the protein changes uh, very significantly, the conformation, of course, uh, the, the the fingerprints will be very different. So uh, we assume that the, the conformation doesn't change dramatically uh, as a result of the interaction. I uh, good. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, another question is uh, like kind of in uh, in in thinking about uh, uh, your mesh representation. Um, uh, do you need a lot of space in terms of gigabytes, terabytes to to save this geodesic uh, mesh representation? Yeah. So good question. Indeed, the first uh, version of Massive uh, required uh, significant uh, memory and actual disk storage. So the precomputation was was uh, rather uh, memory hungry. With the new version, everything is computed on the fly. So both the features, the coordinates, uh, and the surfaces. So uh, actually, the input is a point cloud uh, of atoms. Sorry. Uh, then uh, just for uh, completeness, uh, and, and I guess an easy one, uh, how do you get the, uh, the shape of the target protein? The shape of the target protein. So usually we look at uh, uh, at co-crystallized proteins. So we know uh, basically how uh, how the, uh, uh, the the interacting partners uh, look like. So of course the target. We assume that we know the target a priori. Uh, it's uh, we can in principle try to discover it, uh, uh, but usually you you know uh, the target in uh, let's say in drug design as far as I know, and you try to find uh, something that that will bind to it. Uh, great, because then uh, the, the follow-up question is, uh, does your um, uh, interface detector uh, assume constant uh, distance between proteins? Um, how does it perform if you have variable binding distance? So it doesn't, well, uh, basically, uh, this is, this is a, a, a function of how you design your, your training set. So in designing the training set, we define uh, uh, basically a site uh, as a point uh, which is uh, sufficiently close to, to, to the uh, to the part of protein, and uh, this way, essentially, uh, the, the definition of uh, of uh, 
say of interface or non-interface uh, is uh, cooked, uh, baked or baked into the the, uh, uh, the training set. Um, agree. So uh, a follow-up question on this is: Have you thought about uh, using any kind of self-supervised, unsupervised uh, pre-training uh, for this protein surface semantics? Right. So, well, we uh, of course we have. So there are some works in geometric deep learning that, that try to do uh, uh, to, to use self-supervision. So it's a little bit similar to what is used in computer vision as well. Yes. So this is uh, definitely a very interesting direction. Um, uh, another another question is: uh, Can you comment on the process for picking sequences for uh, the design part? Uh, how many and how do you explore uh, explore them, or do you learn them directly? Good question. So I'm afraid that uh, my knowledge in uh, in in protein and how exactly they are uh, they are produced is uh, rather uh, rather limited. So uh, it probably it's better that this question is asked to my collaborators who did all the the. All the, the design and the, the experimental part. So I think uh, short answer. I don't really know. Can you say more about how many how many you 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 actually screened at the end? How many we screen at the end? Uh, you mean uh, how many uh, how many candidates? So actually, out of the four binders that we designed, three of them showed binding uh, experimentally. The fourth one were unable to crystallize. Uh, as far as I know, well, for for other reasons potentially, but uh, it's it's pretty good hit rate. Uh, uh, three out of four is not bad. Okay, uh, super. Uh, thank you. Um, then uh, another uh, another question um, is is about um, uh, uh, more broadly. You know, what do you see as other potential applications uh, for uh, geometric deep learning in this uh, in this space? Well, so it's, it's a good question. So uh, I, I think when it comes to interactions, uh, I, I think surface-based or, or uh, representations, and by surface, I don't necessarily mean mesh. It can be point clouds. It can be implicit surfaces like, like level sets. Uh, it seems that they really make sense because uh, it, indeed you don't care about the, 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 the internal structure. And uh, I, I think there are, of course, uh, traditional approaches like three-dimensional convolutional neural networks. So first of all, they're wasteful. Second, it's difficult to build in, in, into them any invariants. And uh, third, uh, you, uh, you spend a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, bits in representing uh, structures that, that, that you don't need. Uh, um, so uh, geometric deep learning in this sense uh, uh, is probably the, the, the right approach. Of course, there are other problems in, uh, in proteins such as, uh, for example, folding where uh, this might not be uh, might not be the, the right representation. So beyond proteins can be any uh, uh, any biological molecules could be RNA molecules, uh, DNA molecules. Uh, uh, well, we've been uh, talking to some people that, that that work in in the biotech industry as well, doing sensors, for example. So uh, uh, yeah, potentially there, there, there are many uh, many applications. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, I'll ask a, a few more questions. Um, and so one, um, Mukut Murthy is asking, oh, with BERT, we have seen long range dependencies are important for tasks like secondary structure and contact map prediction. Also, there are channels from the inside of the protein that might lead to the modification of the, on the outside. Um, can we confidently say that the inside of the protein is irrelevant or can you comment uh, this, uh, the importance of long modeling long range de dependencies for, um, uh, for yeah. protein structure design. Right, so, well, uh, I think, again, uh, take it with a grain of salt because my knowledge of proteins is rather limited. It is obviously an assumption. In some cases, uh, it works. In some cases, maybe it's uh, just too simplistic. So um, I think in, uh, in, the long, uh, in the long term, we do want to look at, uh, uh, at the sequences or uh, that, that also represent uh, uh, the, 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 the internal structure of the protein together with the structure. So we want to see, for example, how uh, the structure is formed by, the, by different folds and uh, uh, in which cases, maybe even finding which cases the, the, the internal fold uh, 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 makes uh, uh, a difference for, for, the, uh, for, for the interaction uh, would, be, would be important. Uh, I, I would say that uh, all these uh, proteins that, that for example, uh, kind of 
uh, a kind of empty space that opens up when uh, approached by another protein. That, that kind of stuff we cannot model with Massive. And uh, I, I remember that when the, the paper was out, there was a discussion with uh, Mohamed al, -Al, -Al Kirashi, who was saying that he was uh, surprised that uh, uh, surface only uh, uh, is sufficient for uh, modeling many interactions. So yeah, I guess it is not uh, an obvious uh, thing. It, it works uh, probably as any modeling assumption. It, it is good for certain cases only. Okay, uh, great. Uh, thank you so much, Michael, for this fascinating talk and uh, for joining us uh, um, and um, enjoy the rest of your evening in Europe, I guess.